good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time of day it is you're watching, welcome to another week of New Life Community Church, Home Church. I'd like to start by saying thank you. Thank you for allowing me into your home over several weeks over the course of this pandemic. It's been an honor and a privilege to join you in worship. I only wish that I could see your face on the other side. I'd like to share with you uh, a, a line from a song that, that God has been whispering that he's just put on my heart um, that's helped me get through the last couple of weeks. And I've probably shared some before, but this one uh, is one that's particularly special to me. It's a song that I first heard when I was a teenager at a youth retreat. It goes, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It comes from Psalm 119 verse 105 which reads, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. I find that song incredibly reassuring, especially in this day and age when, I don't know, we feel like our world might be full of darkness, knowing that God is the light of the world, that he will be our light in the darkness. When the path or the road ahead of us seems unclear, and who hasn't felt that? at all in the last five months, when the, when the path in front of us is uncertain and unclear and we're not sure where our life is going, God knows the plans that he has for us. What a beautiful reassurance. God's word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. The God who made the heaven and the earth is leading us. My brothers and sisters, I pray that you will be reassured on a daily basis that God is with you, that you are part of the, the church family, whether we're together in a building or we're connecting through video. And remember that your help is in the name of the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Savior leads me. Who have I to ask beside? Could I doubt his tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? All the way my Savior leads me. Cheers each winding path I tread and Gives me grace for every trial Feeds me with the living bread You lead me Keep me from falling You care Carry me 
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you because you are great. You're filled with goodness. You have been kind and merciful. We praise you because you have obeyed the Father and gone to the cross for the glory of God and for the benefit of humanity. We praise you, Jesus, because you have called us to yourself. You have said, come, follow me. And so we come. And you lead. We know that you will lead when it's easy for us to follow, and we know you lead patiently, slowly, carefully, when it's hard to follow you. We thank you that as you lead us, you speak to us, you instruct us, You help transform the way we think, what we understand, so we can lead others as well. Lord Jesus, you are our king. You are our redeemer. You are our shepherd. And shepherds lead their flock beside quiet waters so they can drink. They lead their flock into fields where there's plenty to eat so they may eat. And when satisfied, lay down and rest. In this way, you restore our soul. So by your word and by your spirit, good shepherd, we ask you to lead us into all truth. Heal the brokenhearted. Strengthen the fearful. Give wisdom where it is needed, courage where it is needed, decisiveness when we need it. Good shepherd, we follow your lead, for you are our good shepherd. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Today we are finishing up our study of the book of Acts. This summer we have gone through the book of Acts to see, through, see it through one lens, which is how the Holy Spirit leads the church to testify, to witness to the world about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Christ is the sealing event of his work that he did for our glory. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit did not leave Christ on the cross or in the grave so that he could simply pay for sins, but they raised him from the dead to defeat death. There's a lot of theology in the doctrine of the resurrection. But the Holy Spirit has to lead the church in how to be witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. And so we have looked at the book of Acts. We've looked at the different stories the comments, the thoughts, the teachings. And we've tried to see how the Holy Spirit leads the church. And that's very important because as we come to the last chapter and the last comments of the last chapter, what we're going to find out is now it's on us. It's not on the Apostle Paul. It's not on Luke or Mark or Barnabas or or even Peter or James and John. That's 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit faithfully led them how to witness. And now he faithfully leads us how to witness. And so as we come to this end of the book of Acts, we come to it knowing that now it's on us, on you and me, the church today. Jumping from the last chapter of the book of Acts, the last comment, all the way to now, today, to you, to me. It is the church's mission to testify to the world about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All that that means, both personally for the church as a whole and also for the world. That is summed up in the phrase preaching the gospel, the good news of the work of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I can't review everything that's in the messages we've given. I can't walk through Acts and show all of that. But what I want to do 
is have us look at that last conversation that, that God inspired Luke to capture. Remember, Luke is the author of Acts, and he captured what we needed to know. And it's interesting how he sort of comes full circle in this last chapter, in this last half of a chapter, and the last story he tells, so we can see that the gospel began in Jerusalem among only Jews, because it was all Jews who believed. There were some Gentiles who were God-fearers, and, but the story is how it includes the Gentiles. And eventually, because of Paul's ministry and through his ministry, God says from now on, the gospel will also go to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. It explodes outside of the very important, but very small setting of the Jewish history, culture, and group in Jerusalem. And then Judea and Samaria. That's the original parameters, the, the original borders of Israel. When you get to the northern tribes that is now, was then Samaria, you have now seen the full traditional historical Israel reached with the gospel of Messiah. But God was not done then. God was not done then just like he never was done because he wanted to reach the world. You remember in John 3, 16, the famous passage that God loved the world so much he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God loved the world. And in the history of his revelation, the history of salvation, God called Abraham and gave him a covenant and said, I will bless you and through you the nations will be blessed. And the way that blessing came to all the nations was first through the nation of Israel. God gave his law. God revealed his character. When you read four-fifths of the Bible first, which is the only scripture that all the New Testament writers had, that Paul had, that Jesus had, that Peter had. When you read the scriptures, God has revealed his character, his will, some history that is necessary for us to know. And he did it through a people he formed called Israel. God formed Israel. And throughout the Old Testament, Israel is often called my servant, my son. The ultimate servant and the ultimate son is Jesus, the Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords to all, first King of kings for Israel. And so we have a whole story from beginning to end where God calls Adam back to himself. He calls the human race but to do that, he focuses in on making a covenant with Abraham, starting in chapter 12 of Genesis. It unfolds, and eventually you see Israel at Mount Sinai, freed from slavery in Egypt, and God seals a covenant of the law, not for salvation, but to make them his people. And then through the tumultuous history of Israel, what God comes through in his message is this. I call a people to myself, and Israel is mine. And Israel has a mission to tell the world about me. But a son of Israel, a particular person called Jesus of Nazareth, is specially birthed and anointed, and anointed means the Messiah. He's the anointed one of God to then also make many nations, many, many ethne, many nationalities to be his people. And so the New Testament explodes that covenant of grace and reconciliation first shown to Israel and it's exploded from Israel to the world through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. There's the summary of the book that you read. That's the whole story. Then we zero in in Acts and we see how it happens. As Jesus said in Acts 1.8, Go, witness to my resurrection in the power of the Spirit, first in Jerusalem, then Judea, and then Samaria, and then to the ends of the world. And that was the ministry of the Apostle Paul. That ministry is covered from chapter 13 to the end of Acts. And there's the sweep of it. The history of God's work. The rest of the New Testament, perhaps barring the revelation to John, is not so much about history, but it's explaining who Jesus is and why he matters. Through mostly Paul, others have written, whoever wrote Hebrews, also James, John, Peter, 
So we have these other disciples who explained who Jesus is and how to follow him. Now, with that overview in mind, let's just take a minute to read in Acts chapter 28, starting at verse 17. If you pause the video, you can take some time to find your place there. But I'm going to read starting at verse 17, Acts 28. Paul has been going, he ended up in Rome because he was under trial. He appealed to Caesar, which means as a Roman citizen, he had the right to go to the Supreme Court, essentially, of Caesar's court. And he, he had to be granted that once he appealed it. So he tra eventually travels under guard to Rome. He'd been there a while. It says this at 17. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had a charge to bring against my own people. For I imagine that's because when you appeal, you also make, you might also make a reverse charge, but he didn't have a charge against them. For this reason, I have asked to see you. These are the elders of the church that is in Rome. There are Christians in Rome. It is because of, uh, to, and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel. You see, the hope of Messiah was the hope of the, of Israel. And therefore, he means it was because of the hope of Israel that is in Jesus Christ that I am bound with this chain. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. See, the Christians were a sect within Judaism. That's how they were understood. They were a, a branch. Like you have Hasidic Jews today, and they would be considered a, a sect. And you have the Reformed Jews and other three or four categories. They're parts of the whole. And that's how the early Christians were understood by the Jews. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning until evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. That means the scriptures. The law and of Moses and the prophets means the total package of the scriptures. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. Isn't that amazing? We have Luke recording uh, a very important statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will ever be hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their ears I see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. There I f therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul st stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God. And taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting how Luke finishes there. You get this sense that there's much more to come. And it's just like when he finished the book called his gospel. And started with the book called the book of Acts. He called back and he recalled back and said at the beginning of Acts. In my former book. I, I said all that Jesus began to do and to teach, implying there's more to come now with this new book. He has the same sort of style here. He finishes with an open-ended statement. And Paul, for two years, 
continued to teach about the kingdom of God. There's so much involved in that moment, and it really lends to the idea I'm presenting here that, that after going through Acts, the feel we get is now it's on us. It's on us, on you and me. It's on New Life Church. It's on every group, every denomination, every branch of the church to tell about Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, what it means, how important it is, how it changes the whole story of life. That's on us. It's on us to listen to and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit so that we as a church will testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, if, we, if we're going to pull this off, of all the things we need from this passage and from the study in Acts, I want to just kind of bring up three facts we need to know. We need to know the, the resurrection. It's meaning for us. We need to know very clearly the importance of the resurrection. We need to know its power. We need to know what it means for us. I can't say it all now. That's a series that's very long. But the resurrection means Jesus has defeated death. That this eternal life he offers is secured and guaranteed because he won the day. He defeated death so he could offer eternal life. When God the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, raised the Son from dead, from the dead, he defeated the power of death. Now he's able to promise you and me that though we die, yet shall we live, as Scripture says. That those who live and believe in Christ will not die. That the hope of eternity is sealed and guaranteed because our Heavenly Father has won the day. Now we as Christians need to live with that hope in the struggles of life, as we're raising children, as we're doing careers, as we're finishing or starting careers, as we're going through life as Christ followers to have the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ define our attitude and perspective on life is so important. And if it's important to us, then the most natural thing is for us to share with our friends, our family, our neighbors, that we're not trying to be religious people. We're not trying to be morally perfect people. We are people who are convinced that because Christ was raised, I will too. That no matter what happens, no matter if I live in sickness, no matter if things go well, my life is defined by the resurrection of Christ. My hope is that because God raised the Son, He will raise me because I am in Christ. We each need to find ways to understand that in our own words. We each need to find ways that we can share that with others. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit who is going to whisper directions to us for when it's time to give the resurrection message. Of course, we'll have to find ways to say it that makes sense to people. We're going to have to do it at times that are sensitive and wise. But I think that's we have, what we have in the, in, the, in the book of Acts. We see the Holy Spirit leading people who are trying to figure out how to follow Jesus and how to witness to the resurrection. We see the Holy Spirit lead those kind of people into how to do it. The, thec the second thing we need to know is what the gospel is in simple, clear terms. The good news that the Son died and the Father in the power of the Spirit raised the Son from the dead to defeat death so He could offer us eternal life. A whole new quality of life and a whole new promise of never dying. No other religion offers that. No other promise is made in all our world of such an eternal hope. You see, the resurrection doesn't just promise God's help now. God's grace does that. The scripture that shows he's kind and compassionate, those are the promises that he'll help us. But the resurrection specifically says this is about the big deal, the life that's bigger than life. And so we need to know in simple terms, the good news, which means the gospel, the good news that because Christ was raised, we too will have an eternity with him. And then the third fact we need to know, or the first, maybe better way to say it rather than fact, is 
The third truth we need to grasp and own and experience is how the Holy Spirit leads us to share about the resurrection of Christ. Even the way I just put it is kind of technical. The resurrection of Christ. That doesn't make sense to people in the office or in the shop at your job or in your family. Oh, yeah, that's just religion. That's in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They don't want to hear about it. But, but how do we truly bring into a moment of conversation the fact that Christ being raised changes that situation? I would say, at least in this way, the Spirit has plenty to say to people through us when people are worried about getting sick from the COVID or getting somebody else sick with it because we were infectious. I've heard so many people say it, and it's such a wise statement. I would just not want to get someone else sick and they die from it. I understand that. And yet, where's our confidence? Who is running that show? Our sovereign God is the one who so powerfully raised Christ from the dead. Do you see how I, I put it in light of that? That's not, a, that's not an excuse. It's seeing the same problem from the light of the power of the resurrection. So we need to know that the resurrection transforms everything and the power that God exuded in Christ raising him from the dead is the power that will raise us. And that confidence and that hope ought to transform how we live our lives and think about our days on earth and, and everything about our life. And then we also need to understand this good news in simple terms that we understand and we can share with others. Because if we're going to be the church whose responsibility is to tell others about the resurrection, then we need to have the clear, simple terms. That's for each of us to practice and to work out and to think about. But listening to the Holy Spirit is what we learned from Acts. How is the Holy Spirit whispering to you what the resurrection means to you? How are you praying and asking for guidance so the Holy Spirit will speak to you about it? As you read scriptures, you'll come across phrases that, that are helpful to you in understanding it. The way you understand it is how you're going to share it with others. Out of the naturalness of your words and your understanding, you will simply share it with family and friends and co-workers that, that the Spirit will lead you to. You know, this, this story of Acts, it can seem so, uh, so amazing there's some amazing events that happened. But for every amazing event or big encounter that we see Paul or Peter or somebody have, there are thousands and thousands of untold, unrecorded events of everyday believers who just proclaimed and shared with their co-workers, people in their little village, about the resurrection of Jesus. We don't hear about the thousands of times they were ridiculed for such crazy thinking. I would have liked to read a couple hundred of those stories to be encouraged that that's what I get sometimes. Or we don't have the thousands of little stories of the most simple person simply saying with bold courageousness, I'm not afraid of death because in Christ I will live for eternity. Well, that's a crazy thought. No, God raised him from the dead and he promises in the same way he'll raise me with Christ. And we'll never know the many, many conversations that led to transformation and conversion that some average everyday human being to believe Jesus turned the heart of somebody with such a simple conversation. I wish we had pages in the New Testament on that, but we don't. We need to believe and understand that there are thousands and tens of thousands of those kind of conversations that were going on. We only have in the scriptures the big representative examples. So, We've been through Acts, and we've seen that the Holy Spirit leads the church to witness to, to testify, to tell the world about the resurrection of Christ. We need to know what that resurrection means. We need to be clear that our faith stands on the fact that God raised Christ from the dead, and with him, we too will be raised. That's our eternal future, signed, sealed, and delivered. I hope you have that hope. I do. I've lived with that hope for a long time that I'm going to live and die on this earth, but I'm not done then. There is life bigger than life. 
Because Christ was raised, I too will be raised. That's the promise. I just shared the gospel. We need to be able to tell the good news of that. My life, your life, is, is measured by eternity, not by today. We need to know that gospel of the resurrection so we can share it with others in the simple ways we can and do in our life. You see, from now on, I think the message of Acts from now on is telling the world about the resurrection under the leadership of the Holy Spirit is now on us. May God bless us to that end. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, lead us. Holy Spirit, comfort us, encourage us, make us bold, strong, and courageous. Open the word to us that we could understand it. Help it make sense to us. Have us, give us many aha moments with the word that it makes sense. Holy Spirit, come upon New Life Church. Come on upon the people that are, are listening right now, that they would have a great insight and understanding of the resurrection's power transforming their lives. Come, Holy Spirit. You have been given to us because of the resurrection and so that we can witness to it. Lord Jesus, honor the Father's name by pouring out your spirit on your church yet again. We bless you for your word. We ask for your spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to uh, say thank you for the gifts and offerings you have continued to give so faithfully as a church. And many are using the online giving on our website. That's been about a third of people have, have uh, practiced that and, and, and become comfortable with it. But many have given it on Sundays as they come to church in our two services at 9, 30, and 11. And also, just a reminder, we're hoping and really planning for October 4 to be back in the sanctuary. Uh, and we'll do a 9.30. You will hear details about that. We might still do a small church at 11, but the decision has not been made. But we will at least have the 9.30 here on October 4. If, you haven't, if you've been missing worship and haven't had a chance to come on Sundays, come at 9.30. I, pre, I prefer you to try 11 because there's much more room for that, and uh, it's a little, di little different atmosphere. It's more relaxed, and so you might want to try that. Children are provided for during the 930 service. One more thing about gifts. We've had to replace uh, a fairly expensive uh, air conditioning heating unit uh, for the back part of the church, uh, the education area, and so if you could give an extra gift to um, start to pay, uh, pay back, fill up that savings account we had to drain to do that, we'd much appreciate it. And also, as we go to live streaming, there are extra costs we're having because we have to upgrade the computer because the one we have now cannot even come close to handling the load that it takes. And we're going to need to buy uh, a camera that is far better uh, for what we need to do with that. So there are expenses in that. So if you guys have an interest in helping in either one of those ways, just with an extra gift, and then make a note on your check toward that. Uh, or if you're giving online, uh, give to the building fund or to the worship. In all those ways, we're so thankful for your support. God bless you. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the church said, Amen.